a dog may lesson just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta, or should you? Invest in an MA or a Delta From politics to methodology We'll discuss them all on Teflology Hi, I'm Matthew I'm Rob And I'm Matt And welcome back to Teflology A podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters Presented by three self-certified Teflologists Tefl Pioneers Okay, so for this week's TEFL Pioneer, I'd like to talk about John Haycraft, who is the founder of International House. Mm. Um, are you familiar with Haycraft or International <laughs> House? Uh, I, I did my at International House okay. in Newcastle, um, and I have heard the name Haycraft, but I don't, I don't know him in mm. the biblical sense. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I did my, my Delta kind of through International House London. Right, yeah. okay. So, I mean, yeah, so International House today are a, a well-known teacher training center, and they have, a, well, they have schools all over the world as well, mm-hmm. but they're mainly known for their teacher training. Mm. Yeah. So, and, uh, yes? Actually, I just forgot. I work for International... I taught for International <laughs> House. <laughs> okay, so you, so okay. In, uh, but in Spain. International, yeah. Okay. Okay, in, well, in Spain. that's actually where the first um, school was established, actually, right. in Spain, in okay. uh, Cordoba. Mm-hmm. Were, you, were you there? Nope, I was up in, in San Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very far away so, from Cordoba. Um, so I'll, today I'll briefly explain about John John Haycraft and some uh, a bit of his history and how he came to being the founder of International Health. So um, mm-hmm. John was born in India to the son of a British officer in the colonial Indian Army. Mm. Um, and Haycraft himself joined the army in 1947, but he, he left after a year or so to go to university. Mm-hmm. And I think he went to Oxford University, uh, and right. he, he, his main interest was writing, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but he found after university, as many of us do, it's hard to find a job in writing, <laughs> yeah. for example. So he, he kind of fell into English teaching. Mm. Like most of us like do. Like most of us do. <laughs> and he, yeah, so he began, he began doing private lessons in Toledo, which is in it, Italy? Spain. Spain, again. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so he began, yeah, he began guiding tourists around in Toledo and teaching privately uh, after he graduated. Mm. And it was there that he met his wife, Britta, who's uh, a Swede. Mm-hmm. from Sweden mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. and they yeah they continued to teach together right. and they they opened up their own school in Cordoba mm-hmm. in 1953 okay um, and this was during a time of the uh, well the Franco revolution revolution mm. I guess right uh, dictatorship, dictatorship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't quite it wasn't a revolution at all actually it was a, uh, the dictatorship yeah. um Yeah, so they opened up their school. So they found that, obviously, it came at a time towards the end of the Franco Revolution where a lot of um, young Spaniards needed to get out of the country for their futures. Right. So they found that they had a lot of interest in their school. A lot of um, Mm. young Spanish undergraduates and students Mm -hmm. wanted to learn English to get out of Spain, essentially, (coughs) for their future. So they had a lot of interest in their school. However, it was difficult for them to stay because obviously it was quite repressing, the the Franco regime. So they moved back to the UK. Um, And in 1959, they founded their first school in Covent Garden. Okay. And I think they've since moved to another office in London, somewhere else. Yes. Right. I think think they've moved a couple of times. Yeah. 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 -hmm. Yeah, So anyway, so so they opened up in 1959. Um, and yeah, basically since then they've grew around the world and, and in 1961 they opened up affiliations in Portugal and Algeria, so mm-hmm. mostly European and Northern African countries at first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so today obviously the International House is known for its teacher training certificates mm-hmm. and this began in 19, as early as 1962, mm-hmm. uh, the first type of certificate was formed yeah. and as we know today this has turned into the CELTA certificate right. that kind of developed. Um, it was the RSA, but now it's the CELTA. Well, was it the RSA back in 1962 or was um, it in the, I think in the late 70s it became 
the RSA. Did, mm-hmm. did it have a name when they first brought it in? It was just called the International House Teaching Certificate. Oh, yeah, very imaginative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think at the time it was a four-week course, so it was a very small, very it still is easy still to is. do course. <laughs> Yes, it still is actually, yeah. The intensive course. Actually, no, yeah, come to think of it, it is the intensive course. But that's what it was, it was just a four-week international teaching certificate. And the idea was, well, kind of Haycraft and Britta's um, intentions were that they wanted to kind of professionalise the the teaching of English. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to kind of give uh, young young British people, and apparently the school was only set up for, for British people at the time. Right. Um, who want to travel abroad, go go around the world with this one certificate that everybody would have, mm-hmm. and it would kind of um, kind of standardise the way that people would teach around the world. And I guess you could say that Haycraft invented the idea of travel teaching. Oh really? Like being I thought, a, being I thought a Blitz invented the idea of travel <laughs> teaching. That's what I claimed two episodes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Blitz is it's interesting because um, I've got something written here about Blitz. Um, travel teaching is it, it was kind of a means to an end for Haycraft so he mm. wanted to do his own writing mm. but in order to have an income he needed to teach mm-hmm. in his, as a job basically Right. and I think there's a lot of people that I know today that are doing other things but are professional teachers at the same time so I yeah. think he kind of invented this idea of travel, travel teaching okay. um, in contrast Rob uh, the Burlet School uh, usually taught wealthy politicians and monarchs, etc. Et mm-hmm. However, International House was geared towards um, less affluent people, I guess, or right. young, younger people, as we okay. talked about. Yeah. So that was that was the kind of difference. And mm. um, Haycraft really pushed the idea of the social side of teaching. Right. Um, he liked to use a lot of uh, theatre or drama in his. Uh, classes, yeah, and also he liked the idea that you teach outside of the classroom as well. Mm. Okay, in, in okay. what sense? Well, um, listening to a presentation given by Martin Parrott, who I think was a DOS at International House mm-hmm. um, in maybe Morocco, mm-hmm. and who's also written a very famous grammar book, Grammar for English Language Teachers. Right. Mm-hmm. He um, he said John Haycraft basically told him take the students down to the pub. Right. Okay. Basically, this is a great way to break ice and get to know the students, which mm-hmm. is probably bad advice. <laughs> and, we're, and we're not advocating this on Teflology. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what Haycraft kind of said, try unusual measures to get to know your students. So we kind of pushed the social aspect of, of mm-hmm. teaching, basically. Mm-hmm. I wonder if, well, as far as I know, International House doesn't still push that side of things in terms of, you know, if an International sure. House teacher yeah. asked... Can I take my students down to the pub? Mm. But apparently they actually had bars in a lot of their schools back in the 50s. Um, they, I think they still do. The, the London cafes. cafes and they, didn't, yeah. they didn't in the, uh, the Newcastle one, from what I remember. Okay. They had a, a water machine. <laughs> 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 right. the, uh, the London one on Piccadilly, and I, th- I feel like they've moved since then or they've renovated it, but that had a very famous bar yeah. in the basement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it could be said that Haycraft developed two ideas. He wanted to raise the standards of teaching of English through an affiliated network of schools Mm -hmm. around the world Mm -hmm. and the practical training of teachers for the classroom. Um, And at the time, training for English language teaching, especially of a practical kind, was virtually non-existent. A lot of people went into, well, probably studied at university Mm -hmm. and they actually studied how to be a teacher. Right. And they didn't focus on the practical element Mm -hmm. at all, which is what this four-week course did. It Mm -hmm. pretty much from day one, you're standing up and you're teaching something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Jeremy Harmer attributes the PPP approach to um, the International House Teaching Certificate. Mm -hmm. He kind of said before this certificate, the PPP approach um, wasn't really in common use. Mm. And they kind of focused mm-hmm. on the practical element of teaching. Yeah, yeah. So. It's it's interesting because that's kind of it's similar to um, the the uh, what we have now with master's degrees and you know certificates and diplomas. That you've got a lot of people who have pre-service master's degrees, mm-hmm. and yeah. a lot of people have pre-service certificates. But you know, one's obviously a lot more practically focused, and one's a lot more uh, theoretically focused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a similar thing. Yeah. Um, however, just a, a bit of a counter argument to Haycraft. Um, mm-hmm. It's been claimed that he he actually ruins the the profession of uh, <laughs> language teaching. Um, there's a blog called Marxist Tefl Group, right. and they actually claim that um, his interests weren't in internationalisation at all. They were in um, well, for example, Haycraft was a very wealth. You know, he was the son of a colonial 
mm-hmm. overlord officer. <laughs> overlord. <laughs> officer. Uh-huh. Um, and it's interesting to note that his dad was actually killed by one of his own officers, which oh, right. kind of adds a historical element to yeah. this. But um, yeah, Haycraft was very wealthy, and obviously he wanted to go around the world, swanning around mm-hmm. Europe, basically, mm-hmm. with all of yeah. his money. And it's kind of been argued that he um, he wasn't promoting internationalisation, he was just um, kind of forwarding... Running a the, business. Running a business, and also <laughs> yeah. forwarding the idea of Brit- the Britishness ah, abroad. Pro- promoting kind of British interests. Promoting British interests, yeah. yeah. So you could argue that this this is maybe this kind of course and these kind of teachers coming into TEFL were predominantly British at the time. Mm. This is perhaps where the idea of native speakerism mm. or the native speaker teacher see, kind yeah. of multiplied yeah. and developed perhaps mm-hmm. or linguistic imperialism i think yep. this is what philipson talks about in linguistic imperialism i think we'll probably get to philipson at some point as a as a tefl pioneer in yeah. some way mm-hmm. so um so yeah this blog basically claims that he he ruined um the profession basically <laughs> and i'll just mm-hmm. read the quote um so in, in international house certificates there were a, a reliance on self-reflection rather than on supervision with its eclecticism rather than a body of scientific knowledge, Mm. with its emphasis on private language schools working against the local education systems rather than with them. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, I mean, this is still very prominent today. You have the private sector and the, you know, the... um, the local education sector as yeah. well, and they, they always seem to be in contrast with one another. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we do still have, I think, the problem of um, courses like the the the, the Cambridge Celtic and the, the Trinity certificate. They they do still promote a lot of uh, ideas that maybe aren't that well supported by evidence. Um, mm. So, you know, for example, you know, multiple intelligences and that right. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I remember having to do that in my diploma mm-hmm. and. You know, I, I thought I'd get marked down if I didn't write about it, but I, said, I didn't believe in it at sure, all. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to round up, I mean, Jeremy Harmer, who who most of you should know, Jeremy Harmer, <laughs> uh-huh. he, he took a four-week course, um, and he basically took the course with the thrill of being able to teach anywhere in the world. Yeah. And he taught it in the 70s. And, yeah, he... Um, Basically, he reflected that the course was designed for English nationals at the time, and this is what it said on his certificate, which kind of gives oh, really? you um, an insight into yeah. their, you know, their training <laughs> mm. criteria and thing. And a lot of the course at the time in the seventies fo- focused on st- structure and pronunciation. Mm. And Harmer was commended for drilling well, mm. and at the time, mm. yeah, drilling was a very big. <laughs> what <Yeah>. are you laughing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so that gives you an insight into John Haycraft and mm-hmm. international health. So, what, what side of the fence are you on here? Well, I, th- I think, do you think he ruined things, or do you think <laughs> he uh, developed? I, th- I think that maybe um, he probably did a lot of good. Uh, so, in in producing the uh, well, it, it depends if you see it as good, I suppose. But he 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 obviously played a big part in how yeah. Tefl is today. Yeah. Um, and I guess that the the damage that you could see him as having done. Is something that we're trying to kind of undo um, with things like the uh, the non-native English-speaking teachers in Tessol caucuses and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that maybe there's a reaction against that kind of thing, but I, I think yeah. that you know he, he would have had several uh, positive influences as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. I think in, you know in, yeah. in places where they do require a some kind of certificate, I think yeah. the standard of teaching probably is a little bit higher. Um, I think there's a big difference. People going into the classroom with some experience, um, some experience in the classroom, and some experience with how to plan a lesson, versus people who go in just with a course book, you know, a textbook, and run through it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, obviously, the, having the certificate doesn't guarantee you're going to be a, an effective teacher, um, or even a competent one. Um, but I think it does maybe create a kind of standardized standard. Yeah. 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 So that's uh, John Haycroft. Um, well, we could say the first ELT trainer. TEFL Cultures. Okay, so uh, for this uh, episode's TEFL Culture, um, we're going to be talking about something which has maybe emerged in uh, reaction to what uh, Matt was just speaking about in terms of uh, native speakers and linguistic imperialism and so on. Um, So this is English as a lingua franca, or ELF, or ELF. Mm -hmm. I don't know (laughs) what's the best way to say that. Um, so, have you guys uh, are, you, are you familiar with uh, Elf? Yeah, <laughs> uh, somewhat. Yeah, mm-hmm. I first heard about it. I think I want to say Aya Tefl uh, conference a few years. It's quite a few years ago now, but mm. saw Jennifer Jenkins talk about uh, ELF 
right. and, and get viciously attacked for, for her <laughs> beliefs. Yeah. Um, I think maybe that was my, yeah, that was probably about six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of the, the idea of the lingua franca core, which mm. is, I think, yeah, Jennifer Jenkins' um, argument for kind of standardizing a world English model, basically. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll just give uh, a little bit of background about ELF. So the the basic argument is that um, these days English has more non-native speakers than native speakers. Um, mm-hmm. I think the ratio is something like was it eight eighty percent of English interaction yeah. takes <laughs> yeah. place between non-native speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you analyse um, non-native speaker interactions, you can find these uh, recurrent patterns of grammar, pronunciation, and usage mm-hmm. that are reasonably stable among speakers from various language groups, yeah. um, but not, not necessarily native speakers. Um, and these patterns can be analysed, collected, uh, and sort of generalised into, mm-hmm. uh, as you said, the lingua franca core. Right, right. So this is what uh, Jenkins was talking about, I think, in a book called The Phonology of English as an International Language. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this was the first sort of major work. Um, of, of course, that was about phonology. Since mm-hmm. then, there have been a few other books, um, which I'll talk about later on. Yeah. Um, so. By building the lingua franca core, by passing um, the uh, the control of English over to non-native speakers, the idea is to get away from native speakerism, to get away from linguistic <coughs> imperialism, mm-hmm. um, and well, form a new sort of globalized variety of English. Yeah, <clears throat> there's like obviously received pronunciation and mm-hmm. standard American. So yeah, this is sort of an argument against those models. Yes, yeah. Or against well, teaching those models. Yes. Yeah, or testing, you know, testing, yeah. Yeah, um, and so the, the people who sort of promote ELF um, are arguing that it's, it's democratic, it's not dictated by native speakers, it's something that arises mm-hmm. out, of, um, out of non-native speaker interaction, so it takes some of the power away from native speakers and puts it into the hands of non-native speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a corollary of that, it, it avoids uh, cultural and linguistic imperialism, so that's one big criticism of yeah. uh, of the current model of ELT is that we're, we're often propagating particular cultural ideas, particular mm-hmm. models of English, mm-hmm. um, which empowers native speakers and empowers those cultures, but it ignores many of the other populations of native, uh, sorry, non-native speakers that exist yeah. and are, you know, equally important. Mm-hmm. Um, so ELF is a, is a way around that, I mm-hmm. think, yeah. So, do, what do you think? Do you think it's a, I mean, it's a, a good thing or not? I guess, I guess the, ma- the, the core word is intelligibility. Mm. So it comes down, so if two non-native speakers can understand each other and <clears> they have these common core principles, then <clears> the <throat> fact that they're maybe pronoun- not pronouncing a word in the way that, say, a British person would mm. is, is not of importance, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, the teacher working with, in an ELF setting would, would realise that that's more important, basically. Yeah, well, I think a good example of that is uh, in terms of phonology. Um, so, for example, uh, one of, the, one of the, the features of ELF is that things like weak forms, um, mm-hmm. connected speech, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so on, mm-hmm. um, are not very important. They, they actually hinder intelligibility. Mm-hmm. They don't help yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so it, when, we try, when we teach that, we're trying to make people sound more native-like. Yeah but we actually make them less intelligible to the majority of English speakers in the world by doing it. Um, Another example is that certain grammar forms are dropped. So I think um, third person plural S or something is is dropped because it's um, it's not used by non-native speakers very often. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, it's not important for intelligibility. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So these are kind of some of the arguments uh, in favor of the LF. yeah, and but as you said, it's been a little bit controversial. Some people have taken to it, some people have not. Yeah, I mean, I think well, some of the controver- or some some of the reasons people were attacking Jenkins when I saw it, would, I think they didn't quite understand it mm. basically, and because they were hearing about it for the first time, I think one issue that people have or had was, um, you know, what what is this. Yeah, you know, what are the features of ELF and how are they decided upon? Yeah. Um, as you said, you know, it, a lot of interactions can be examined between mm. non-native speakers. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it may still be difficult to, to you know, d- depending on how much non-native speaker interaction you look at yeah. to get a very good understanding of the type of features that would appear. 
Yeah, well, I think um, maybe the the most important work done on this has been by um, the the team in um, Vienna with the the mm -hmm. Oxford Vienna Vienna Oxford <laughs> uh, corpus of English, which mm -hmm. is the Voice Corpus, right. um, which is a corpus uh, examining entirely non-native speaker right. interactions yeah. and. Mm -hmm. um, I think the major figure in that is uh, Barbara Seidelhofer, Seidelhofer, Seidelhofer yeah, yeah. Um, who uh, wrote a book called uh, "Understanding English as a Lingua Franca," and there she she talks about some of the uh, some of these features that have been mm -hmm. found, some of these features that have been examined. Yeah. So I've I've got uh, yeah, I've got kind of two concerns. Um, <clears throat> obviously, being being an English English teacher, mm. um, how how can I teach it, the Lingua Franca core? Well, you have to learn it's it, very <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Right. Is it? Is it? So, my concern is: is it not better to teach, like, in the way you would receive pronunciation, for example, mm -hmm. with a knowledge that some of this won't stick, some of this will get lost over over their interactions with yeah. other knowledge? Mm -hmm. Is it best to aim for that model? I, I mean, I think you know. So maybe one point is that all of these non-native speakers who are interacting and who would pull this. Um, this dialect of English from yeah. weren't taught that dialect. Mm, um, yeah. That's, that's mm. the one that they naturally use through whatever means they learned English, probably from a native English speaker or, or through the traditional means. Yeah. Um, so maybe to answer your question, Matt, it would mean you don't have to, maybe you don't have to teach it. Yeah. The, the thing that would change, I guess, would be instead of you know, trying to drill students yeah, to yeah, produce a yeah. you know, TH phoneme, you just say, well, you know, you can't use it, you can't produce it, or it's too difficult. Well, to... I, I can't even. <laughs> right, right. Okay, bad example. <laughs> I say, but to I get say, yeah. to get to, you know yeah. to spend to to waste classroom hours yeah. um, saying you know at, getting them to add that third person singular s yeah. is yeah. just a waste of classroom time. Yeah. So, so you could be focusing on more important things. Yeah. So maybe as teachers we should be more sensitive to it, and when mm -hmm. we're assessing it or testing it, mm -hmm. we should be a bit more flexible. And yeah. just focus on the intelligibility issue. Yeah, well, the, there actually have been some people trying to deal with what you're talking about. So, for example, Robin Walker wrote a book called Teaching the Pronunciation of English as a Lingua Franca, which I, I wrote a review of. Um, and in that book, uh, he tries to... Um, it's, it's a handbook for teachers, so he's yeah. trying to show how you can actually teach uh, this style, this, uh, this dialect, as you said, mm -hmm. of, of English. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had some concerns about it because... So for some of the, uh, for some language groups, mm -hmm. it seemed easier for mm. them to learn uh, this, the lingua franca. Right, right. But course. for some language groups, it actually seemed more difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were more, you know, problems occurring mm -hmm. than if you look in, for example, Learner English, mm -hmm. that book. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, there were more problems for certain language groups yeah. than for others. So I don't know if it necessarily makes it easier or more difficult <laughs> for some groups of students. Yeah. Um, some uh, there are some other problems though as well. Uh, so obviously it, it could be difficult to teach. Um, a second point is that some students they like having a target culture. They want to yeah. learn. Their their aim is to go to a you know a, a particular country and in, and and live yeah. there. And yeah, so yeah. for them it's very important to learn right, these right. features. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe maybe in a, a bigger problem is that um, this is an idea which has come largely from Western academics. Mm -hmm. So it's still Western <laughs> academics telling people what to do. <laughs> yes, yeah. I suppose. Um, yeah. And they did try a similar thing before. They had a basic, which was um, mm -hmm. in the sort of 1960s, 1970s, I think. This was uh, a, an attempt to create a form of the language that you could teach to students, which was basic. It was called yeah. basic, and it was yeah. basic did what it said on the tin. Yeah. Um, and that didn't really work because it was felt to be kind of patronising right. in a way. And contrived. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I think there are some issues with ELF. I think maybe the, 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 the discussion that it creates, which I think is a useful one, is, um, yeah, focusing on the needs of your particular learners mm. and then, you know, setting particular goals based on those needs. So if, like you said, you have learners who do want to go and live in an English, native English-speaking country and they are the right type of students, you know, by all means, try to aim for native-like, I don't know, pronunciation or, or yeah. syntax, whatever. Um, but if, you know, if they have different goals, if, if they, you know, want to use English probably to speak to other non-native, mm. then I think it's maybe, like you were saying, just being more sensitive to... Um, well, I think yeah, be, being realistic about the the aims that you can achieve, yeah, mm -hmm. and not 
not pushing things that that are a waste of time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's um, I think it's maybe not quite caught on yet within the field to mm. to a large degree. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future, but I think this is a good example of, as we were saying in, in the first segment of the podcast, um, it's it's an example of a reaction to the you know the the what the dominant model of ELT, which mm-hmm. is native speakers going around teaching people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a reaction to that. So I think yeah. um, whatever the practicalities are, at least its heart's in the right place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, so. I think there's there's a few manifestations of like ELF like we today we talked a lot about pronunciation but that's mm. obviously just one area of it and that's that's one area that's not focused on so much mm. I guess in today's teaching arguably yeah it's the yeah. most overlooked but yeah. I guess it also manifests itself in terms of like like you're saying target cultures maybe textbook materials mm. as well mm-hmm. and mm. the recordings that they actually use in the classes yeah. not always using native speakers yeah basically definitely. so yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the ELF in the future, but it's uh, it's an interesting idea, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's uh, the TEFL culture for this episode. TEFL News. Okay, so for this week's uh, TEFL news item, um, we're going to look at... Well, I'd like to start with a question. Mm. Have either of you ever used any kind of app, like a smartphone app or an iPad? Or tablet app um, yes. for to aid your language learning. Uh, yeah, I've used there's a program that I've used uh, for reading in Japanese called Wakaru, mm-hmm. which uh, mm-hmm. it gives you free books and then you can select words in the books and it gives you a translation for each for the words. Okay, that's quite good. Yeah. I think I used an app which was a test preparation app, so it basically contained all of the vocab items that would be in the test, and yeah. it was just kind of a uh, fill in the gap closed style activity right on okay. I, I could do it on the train very easily mm-hmm. yeah have, have either of you ever tried duo have you heard of duolingo i've heard of it but i haven't tried it okay no, I haven't. at the moment as far as i know it it only does uh european languages french spanish german italian and portuguese right right um, and also i think uh learning english from other languages okay but it's the, the point of it is it's, it's always learning from one language to another. Okay. So, the, for example, the German, langu- the German learning one is just for English speakers learning German. Right. Hence Duolingo. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Um, it, was, it actually started as a, as a project at Carnegie Mellon University mm-hmm. in the States. And then they re- I think they realized that it, it had potential as a business. So kind of they, they let it shoot off into, a, into an actual business. They, right. they do a lot of online learning stuff there, I think. I think I went mm-hmm. to a talk, I think I went to a talk at last, a conference last year, and there was someone from the university talking about, I think, extensive reading as well, and they do a lot of online learning stuff. Mm, okay. okay. Interesting. Yeah, so, yes. Um, I, I, try, I remember I tried it a few months ago, um, and it, I mean, it's very interesting. So the, basically the way it works is you're given a, a series of, Questions. It's broken up into segments and broken up into uh, vocabulary yeah. areas or, or different bits of grammar. Mm. Um, but in each one, each segment you have to pass, and for each segment you have to do you have to do different things. You either have to translate um, from your L, the L one to the L two, mm-hmm. um, so it gives you a sentence, and then you have to move words into the correct order, right. or you have to t- actually type out the sentence. Um, but it can be L one to L two or the L two to the L one. Okay, um, it or does. Both. One after the other. Or one after, yep. Um, it'll give you a sentence to read, so it'll check your pronunciation of, of actually reading a sentence in the L2. Um, what else? What are the other ones? Oh, or it'll, it'll play an audio of the L2, and then you have to type out what you hear. Okay. So it's, it's testing a variety of skills. Mm. Um, so the, the, the news item is that uh, Carnegie Mellon now is, is partnering with Duolingo, because obviously they have the connection to create uh, testing. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea is to replace IELTS and TOEFL specifically for uh, testing for university and basically non-native students who want to study in an in English-speaking university. Right. Yeah. Um, instead of doing an IELTS or a, or a TOEFL or a TOEIC, they right. do a Duolingo design test. Okay. Um, the advantages are it's cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it on your phone. Is this a sales pitch? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think the idea is, um, yeah, so the, uh, instead of students having to go to a center at a specific day and time, yeah. 
they can just do it whenever they want. Right. Um, is, is that sorry? Yes. Is that is that testing then sent somewhere for, to be marked? Do, do they get an actual formal formal score or something? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a test. So is, is there a danger of people just getting their mates to do it for them? Right. Yeah. So obviously that's that. I think that was the big thing that they had to work on before right. they did this. So what it does is it uses the camera in your phone. It looks at your face and it checks. Well, first of all, it looks at your face, makes sure you are who you, you say you are. Right. And then it also does things like it tries to pick up background noise. Yeah. It, it looks at the eye movement. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's like constantly looking off the right. uh, camera at answers for something yeah. or right. somebody else is, you know, quickly. What if this was like answers. a John Travolta, Nicolas Cage face right. off type situation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, what I think that's... What in that case? Yeah, yeah. You just put, put a mark, you just put, a, like, a cardboard cutout in front of... Ah, uh, that's good. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> I, can see, I can see problems. <laughs> right, well, I think that's the interesting thing. I think it's no matter how... No matter how well they, um, you know, try to safeguard against those kind of things, there's always going to be people who are finding yeah. ways around it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it'll be... A, I'm with ETS recently in the TOEIC. After all their safeguarding of just leaving people to get on with it. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So I think that, uh, one thing they mentioned in the article I read about it was about ETS, um, how, yeah, how that's an example of, you know, the, even those kind of formalized tests, that to, I think it was TOEFL, mm -hmm. um, there's always, you know, room for corruption or, or, yeah. or misdeeds. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I think it, it's nice if, if students can just take the test wherever. Mm -hmm. They say 20 minutes is certainly long enough to get a good idea of somebody's language proficiency. Right. Um, do, you, do you think, because this comes back to what we were talking about before, about the wow factor of technology. Mm -hmm. right. um, do you think that this will last, and do you think this is more motivating for the students? Is it easier? Because technology sh arguably should be used for ease, rather than just the actual... Yeah, yeah. I, th I mean, I think it is. I think if it means that you don't have to, you know, pay a hundred pounds, which is yeah. what IELTS was, I don't know what it is now, yeah. mm -hmm. and go to a certain place on a certain day with people and there, sit there, yeah. and you know, takes up your whole day. Yeah. If you can just at any, so they, they say this would cost twenty dollars. Right, it takes okay. twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. You do it whenever you want, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the results get, you know, would get sent straight to the university that you've applied to. Um, I don't know, how, uh, yeah. they didn't mention in terms of you know, how many times you can take it. I imagine there right. would be people just taking it over and over again. Yeah, no, it's their money, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. And are there universities that accept this as, a, as an entry, entry requirement? Uh, not yet, no. not yet. Right. They're, they're, it's just, it's at the early stages. Um, this is just in the US or uh, the UK? For now, for now. Um, but I think they're, they're, they've partnered with Google on this. Um, oh, so I think they'll, it's... they'll be fine then. They'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe maybe the interesting thing for me is, obviously, I, I, I don't know so much about the TOEFL test. I know the IELTS test, obviously the speaking component does require you to speak to a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it does show your ability to interact yeah. with a person. As far as I know, that, or based on the app at least, this doesn't. Right. Um, it would test your speaking ability in terms of maybe pronunciation, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. which the IELTS does as well, but that's not the main point um, in terms of, you know, reading something. Right. I guess the question would be, in the future, do you think it would be possible for a computer-based test to test interaction? Mm. Uh, I think possibly, this is, what's the name of that test? Is it the Turing test? Right. Where you, you try and, a computer... If a computer can convince you that you're having a conversation with an actual person, yeah. then it's passed the test for artificial intelligence uh, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be a bit like a bit like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think not yet would be my guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think I think possibly in the future, but at that point, you know, Skynet will uh, come <laughs> online and <laughs> uh -huh. we'll have Terminators attacking us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, yeah, I, I always come on to the argument that it is just the wow factor. We've got this new technology, but mm -hmm. does it, I mean, it already works, doesn't it? The, the current model, yeah, you said it's more, it's cheaper to do this, mm -hmm. but, you know, it still works, though, doesn't it? it doesn't, aren't they kind of, aren't the big testing organisations looking after their own pocket anyway? And they kind of have a monopoly on this whole thing anyway, so yeah, I don't see how, I mean, this is just adding another... Mm. Another mm -hmm. hand in hand in the hat, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pocket of money yeah. testing. 
I mean, the, the, the way they pitched it, at least in this article, is that they, they, they want to completely change the testing market. Which yeah. has become a big business, and, yeah, and, and it's, yeah. Yeah. it's not a monopoly, but it's it yeah. could end up being one. Right. Um, yeah. And obviously, that doesn't necessarily result in the best types of tests. And as uh, Rob alluded to earlier, um, ETS, which is one of the um, big test providers, yeah. Um, yeah. They, yeah, it was, I think it was the BBC who uncovered a scandal there yeah, about okay. Pan Panorama. Right, <laughs> about wide, widespread fraud oh, yeah, uh, within yeah, that's ETS. True, yeah. That was recent, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so that the British hilarious. government, <laughs> the British government, re like basically they removed ETS as an acceptable yeah. test provider. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which some people have said that's a bit cynical because that means the only test you can do now really is uh, IELTS, which is provided <laughs> by the British. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, although it is, I. In my opinion, it's a better test. I think it's a better test, but you know, yeah. you can see why people would be a bit suspicious. Of you course, raise the eyebrows. So right. There's, there's certainly a gap in the market for for this then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think so. But you know, talking about the fraudulent issue, I mean, this seems quite easy to, you know, to fake. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's that. That is the tricky thing. Is is at what point it, or when can they get it to a point where it is reliable? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, I think um, or I valid. Think, I guess it would be reliable. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess in terms of this um, this judging interaction, mm -hmm. I think at the moment with the current technology, it would just be reduced down to certain points of interaction. So they'd be able mm -hmm. to program computers to recognise certain points of interaction, yeah. or certain bits of interaction, mm -hmm. but not the whole thing. I guess not to judge interaction as a whole. I think that would be mm -hmm. the difficult part because they yeah. don't have the Computers obviously they don't have self awareness and they don't have the social experience that people have the way you know ways of interpreting things yeah socially yeah. the way that people do so I guess it was difficult for them to do that kind of thing the um, for example the you know the the part of the test where the computer plays a or, you know plays a bit of audio of somebody speaking or the computer says it itself I don't know how they do it mm. if for example if the test taker were able to say oh, I'm, you know sorry could you repeat that or what does that word mean yeah which right. You know, maybe they're not answering the question, but they're displaying um, good interaction skills. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. What, what, could we reach a point where that kind of thing is tested? I think you probably could, but um, I don't know if we're there yet. <laughs> sure. That's the issue. And yeah. another, another thing to ask is, does this app have a lingua franca core understanding? <laughs> because if it doesn't, then... It could be based we'll, on We'll go that. back to the old dog. Yeah. 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 It's a thread running all the way through this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We planned that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, that was uh, today's news item. Okay, so thank you for listening to this episode of Teflology. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with us to make any suggestions or uh, give us some comments, um, you can email us at teflology at gmail.com. Uh, please leave a rating or review on iTunes uh, if you are so inclined. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. <laughs> and goodbye. <laughs>